I'm Kenton Claremont, and you're listening to the Train to Hunt podcast. Dude, there he is. He's coming in. Get ready. ready. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Train to Hunt podcast. I am Kenton Claremont, your host, and I am with Jesse James Wise, and we are stoked to be sitting down with Chris Denham. And Chris is uh, the owner of Wilderness Athlete, Western Hunter Magazine, and also um, Western Hunter, the TV show. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. And you co-owners know, and all that stuff. Co-owners yeah. and all that. He's a big, he's got yeah. a big hand in it. <laughs> all right. I'm the war chief. For okay. Those, for those <laughs> he's the war chief of Whatever Wilderness happens. Athlete. Yeah. Um, so... Chris, a lot of our, you know, you're kind of behind the scenes guy, really. I mean, a lot of people when they t- when they see the show, or they see the magazine, or they see the the product, um, they don't, you know, they don't see your face too much. They'll see your, your writing in the magazines every once in a while. They'll see your face on the show every once in a while. But a lot of people don't know kind of your story and how you got to be part of this this uh, big conglomerate of outdoor uh, outdoor stuff. So why don't you get, just fill us in on how you got there? Cool. I'm glad you actually said that you don't see me out in the front because that is literally by design. You know, as we build build these brands, I never never wanted it to be, you know, the Chris Denham show in any way. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's why I've worked really hard to do. We have worked really hard to just find really talented people and just keep bringing them in and pushing them out front. Yeah. But, uh, you know, my, my story in this industry, it's it's a long and involved one, but it's because people ask me all the time, like, how do you get in this business? And I said, yeah. I, I could tell you my story in an hour. And like, there's no way you can replicate this. <laughs> right. You know, my story is my story. You're going to have to find your own. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, you know, it's every because everything I did in, to get into this industry and, and to move up to another level was out of pure necessity. I needed a job. You know, I, yeah. I needed and this just happened to be here right now. And I'm like, OK, I like doing this. I mean, my first job in the industry, I have a degree in agriculture. Um, Interesting. And my first job in the industry, I was working retail because I couldn't, I had to wait six months to get on with a, a state agency. Yeah. So I had to pay the bills. We were married. My, my, my wife was starting medical school and, and had to at least get some co- income coming in. And I took a job for $3.85 an hour working at a sporting goods store just to, you know, get some hours. Yeah. And, uh, and and that's how I, that's I literally, how I get started with a college degree, making $3 and 85 cents an hour. <laughs> it's pretty common. <laughs> yeah. Common. Yeah. Yeah. I worked retail and then <clears throat> it stayed on with them. Cause I uh, moved in and managing the retail store and then a wholesale. And, uh, when I was in our wholesale division, I knew, got to know all the sales reps in the industry. And, uh, then when my wife finished medical school, we were moving up to Phoenix. So I put the word out to all of my reps. I'm like, Hey, I'm looking for a job in Phoenix. You know, once again, I need a job, you know, it was like, I don't care what it is. And, uh, yep. one of my reps said, well, I need somebody that can talk, you know, can talk hunting and, and can shoot a gun. And, and we use a Beretta rep and Swarovski reps, uh, at the time it was independent rep, rep agency. Okay. And, uh, so we were Beretta reps. And so I was going to police departments, you know, and ha- handling guns. And then it was Swarovski back then. I mean, when I did Swarovski seminars, we literally, you know, I'd go to a retail store and I'd say, "It's this is Swarovski. And then we had to start how to pronounce it. It's oh, like right. swear off skiing with Swarovski. Yeah. It's not Skavorski. It's not, it's, it's Swarovski. Yeah. I mean, nobody even knew the name. Yeah. Jeez. Um, what, so what year was this, Chris? That was 90, that would have been 92. Okay. It didn't seem that long ago until I realized it's 2018 right now. I know, I know. We're <laughs> it's dating crazy. ourselves, yeah. I know. Yeah, I still have a price sheet uh, from when I was a rep with Swarovski at the time. And uh, 10 by 42 SLCs came out in, gosh, was it 92 or 93? But anyways, it, it retail at rate 99. You know, and, uh, really? And now they're, what, $1,600, dollars yeah. But uh, uh, our entire territory, uh, we were, I was covering Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, geez. for Swarovski. And we did $325,000 in gross sales in that territory. Now there's probably, there's probably eight or nine accounts that do more than that. That's you know, some accounts doing three times that. You know, wow. That's incredible. So what was cool for me was I kind of got on the front edge of, of the optics movement yep. and, and, uh, and you know, so I got to hang out with some really cool people and, and get to use some really cool products. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I did that for, oh gosh, about seven or eight years. Okay. And then it was just time to, I knew it was time to move on. <clears throat> it was, uh, so I, I left the rep business and started guiding, uh, guiding full time when I, you know, during the fall. And, uh, 
and then I was also working, doing contract work for Swarovski in the archery industry, uh, inter- I was introducing the professional archers to Swarovski and kind of managing their team. Yep. And, uh, and then somewhere in the middle of that, um, Floyd Green, who's my partner with Western Hunter Magazine and, and the TV show and Wilderness Athlete, he owns the Outdoorsmans. Gotcha. And we came up with the idea of we want to make a catalog because we were making our, our own products by then, making our own tripod. And mm-hmm. we knew we couldn't afford to advertise nationally. So we're like, well, let's make our own advertising tool. So we started this. We called it a matalog. It was kind of a magazine, kind of a catalog. Yeah. Uh, pretty soon people wanted to advertise, and then pretty soon people wanted to buy a subscription. And it wasn't even, we were just mailing them free. Yeah. And uh, so we incorporated the magazine and started Western Hunter. And that was, gosh, I think we're in 13 years now. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. So, and it's just kept, you know, growing from there with, uh, you know, uh, Ryan Hatfield came on board. Yep. And, uh, and Ryan, uh, is the one that told me, and I knew Nate Simmons. <clears throat> yeah. We'd just known each other th- through in, through the industry, and uh, he said Nate Nate's leaving and was looking to do something. He goes, I think we need to start a TV show. And I thought that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you show me somebody that's making a living and doing a TV show, and we'll do that. I remember the first time that we were talking, and you and we started talking about Western Hunter, and I, how I thought Western Hunter was like the like the best hunting show on TV, and it kind of got me back watching hunting shows. And you were like, honestly, I had no interest in doing a yeah. TV show. I just kind of laughed. I was like, yeah, I guess I don't really blame you, but that, yeah. it's amazing. You know what you guys do now is just unreal. Yeah, because yeah, I, I one thing I've learned in my business career. If you're not first to market, you better be the best, yep. you know, because there's not much room for, you know, second place. Yeah. And, uh, no. So when Nate, I said, we sat down at the, at the ATA show. Yeah. I still remember sitting there with Nate in this bar. He's wearing his Boise State uh, sweatshirt. And, and, Go Broncos. Uh, yep. <laughs> and, uh, and we talked to him. And he said, well, let's just build a pilot. You know, let's just, I, he talked a little bit about his vision and, and then he had a couple of other guys, Randy, uh, Randy Rocky, and uh, that he was working with, and Cody, and they built the pilot. And I was like, "All right, let's see it." And we we were all on a conference call, and watched it, and I was yeah. like, "Holy crap, this is it! That's next level this stuff." Is it. And I'm like, "This is it. This will work." What a, Nate's so talented, man. <clears throat> oh he's yeah, he's so fun. He's so fun to watch. He's such a good writer and speaker. And, yeah, and just the, the way he, uh, you know, just lets his emotions like. You know, out on the sleeve on, on cameras, it's awesome. It's fun. If you know, if you guys haven't watched Western Hunter, do it. Yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah it's he, really he's good. A, he's a reluctant hero. <laughs> and that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. So then, uh, so now you got the magazine, you got the the uh, TV show, and then where does where does Wilderness Athlete end up in there? With Wilderness Athlete, it was a it's a comical story. If I don't know if it's been even been told before, but. Uh, so a wilderness athlete came onto the into the market and we were not the original wilderness athlete everybody might remember yeah it was a long and, time ago yeah and they made a couple of they made a couple of buying mistakes and and ended up having to close the business but when they <clears throat> when they first started it uh, there was they didn't have the domain name wildernessathlete.com but a friend of ours did and oh. but the friend of ours they called him up and said hey you know we'd like to buy this name from you and he's like cool you can buy it but if you guys go out of business, I get it back. Gotcha. So, so he was the first one to find out they were going out of business, and he called us and he said, "You guys might want to look at this, you know, because it, you know, I think it, I think it could work." So I still remember Floyd and I sitting in a in a bar, and he's telling me about it, and I'm like. I said, dude, I think we could spray Wilderness Athlete on a T-shirt and make money. I mean, the name was just so cool. For sure. And, yeah. and we're like, all right, let's do it. Yeah. And we joked that we had two nickels to rub together when we did that. <laughs> and we spent both of them, you know. And <laughs> so we we started it just, I mean, literally we had the cash flow from day one. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and we still laugh because the first day we turned the website back on, like 30 minutes later, we got an order. We're like, wow. holy crap. This is going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, right. All you got to do is turn the website on and money starts coming in. Right, <laughs> right. But we found out a little later, it was, it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah. But. And it's come a long ways. Like I remember way back in the day and like most businesses, especially, you know, the supplement business, you got to find out what people, are, what the demand is, right? Right. And I remember like I, I started taking Wilderness Athlete products back when you guys originally started making bars. And then I think there was like some sort of energy shot that came out. Oh, yeah. And there's some gel. And then you've always had hydrate and recover. Right. And that was like, that was really my first introduction to Wilderness Athlete back in like 2008. 
eight, maybe two thousand, yeah, right. about two thousand eight, two thousand nine, maybe. And uh, I went on a big backcountry um, mule deer hunt with Dan Staten. And uh, we brought the, we brought two like gallon jugs full of nothing but hydrate and recover, and we drank it the whole time we were in the back country, and it, it was just like sold immediately. I mean, it was hot. We were putting on tons of miles in these this rugged country, and just staying hydrated with that hydrate and recover. And then afterwards, I remember we sitting on a tailgate and we're just like dripping sweat. And we got this jug of pink stuff between us, and right. we're chugging and talking about how I think this may have just like helped us hunt as hard as we did. And yeah. that was like back in 2008. So hydrate. you guys have come a long way since then, though. No doubt, no doubt. And you know, kind of back to that: <clears throat> if you're not first, you better be the best. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. when we got involved in it, um, we had no interest in being in the nutrition business. Literally we did not we would, did not acquire that name of wilderness athlete to go into nutrition okay. we were going to go we just figured we're going to go some other direction yeah and then uh but then uh we met coach p met yep. mark paulson yeah and he's like guys we can make this happen yeah and so from the and floyd and i knew nothing about nutrition i mean nothing to me nutrition was you know a, a bucket of protein that you got at gnc yeah you know, right. that was my idea of nutrition right and uh so we said, all right, if we're going to do this, we just, we got to, we got to know that no matter what we do, we're making the best product possible. Yep. Even if it costs twice as much as somebody else, because we didn't know enough about nutrition to make excuses for a poor product. You know, mm-hmm. right. we could, we didn't have a sales pitch to sell something crappy. We just had to be able to stand on our, our product and say, you know what? I know because somebody else told me right. that I really trust that this is the best, you, this is the best formula that you, you can use for outdoor nutrition. Right. And so it's been a. It's been a fun journey, but hydrate recover is, it's Staple. like there's something golden in that. Yeah. There is something. I love well, that there's, stuff. Well, the one, the, I mean, there's a thousand milligrams of vitamin C. Right. I mean, if you compare the label to like a hydrate recover and like emergency, there's more good stuff in the, yeah. in the, the hydrate recover than there is in emergency. And there's people that, man, they just swear by that emergency yeah. to avoid illness and like boost their immune system. And you're getting all of that in your hydrate recover. Plus you're getting branch change. You're getting all these things for just like muscle recovery. And so it, it, it was, I mean, it, it had me sold from the first time I looked at the label and used it. I was just like, man, I'm, I'm in on this product for sure. But, um, but I got a funny story about how you're covered. Let's do it. It's like, you know, you always wonder, okay, is this just placebo, you know? But mm-hmm. so we were going to, I was going to, you've done the rim to rim to rim with us last year. So we're going to do the, I'm going to do the rim to rim at first, first time ever. And two weeks before I was like, okay, I planned this out well ahead. And I said, I need a test. So my wife and I went and we hiked from the, the South rim down to the river and back out. So not even quite half of the rim to rim to rim. So we were hiking, coming out. And uh, there's a spot in the middle uh, where there's a rock wall for about 200 yards. It's almost bench height. Yep. And you I sat, remember, I sat, I sat on, on that wall. <laughs> yeah, it's a good sitting place. So my wife and I sat down, you know, next to each other, and, and we're just mixing up you know, hydrant recover. And and I see this dude coming up the trail, and I could just look in his face, and I'm going, "That's rim to rim rim guy." Mm-hmm. And he's just grinding it. He's just barely plodding, and he's plodding. He's coming up, and he literally sits down and plops down right next to me. That was a 200 <laughs> yard long wall. There's two of us sitting here, and he sits right next to me like he's my girlfriend he needed know? some company <laughs> yeah. Yeah, i'm like so i'm looking over and i'm like dude you doing okay and he's like no i'm not i said you did a rim to rim to rim and he's like yeah and he was he was in bad shape yeah and i looked at him and said you i've got the you know some this hydrant recover stuff so it worked pretty good you want to try it he's like sure yeah. I mean, would you take something like you've never tried before yeah. from some dude you have no idea? <laughs> I know where he was at, yeah. though. Oh, yeah. Just been there. You want to fly? I got it, something that'll make you fly. <laughs> if, it's got, if it'll help me feel better. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I mixed him up one, shook it up, and handed it to him. He's like, man, that tastes good. And then I could see his, his face is getting a little bit better. So my wife and I took off, and we got up to Indian Gardens, which was another mile, and we're filling up our water bottles there. And he comes past us. He goes, man, that stuff was really good. I'm sure you guys will pass me again never saw him again i mean he just crushed us getting out of there and then the next morning we walked into the to the lodge and him and him and all of his crew that had done the rim to rim were there and he jumped up like he just saw you know santa claus <laughs> you know? And he like all but hugged me saying, his long laugh was that stuff that was amazing he says i just walked out like it was nothing from Jeez. that and there was no he had no idea what he was taking you know yeah. no sales pitch no nothing just, yeah. just he just knew whatever it was it made yeah. him feel better it really helped yeah. him cool that's a huge testament i mean because yeah. 
I mean, the rim to rim to rim, for those of you that don't know what Chris is talking about, that is the Grand Canyon. You start on the north rim, walk the 23 point some miles to the south rim, and then turn around and walk back, and you try to do it in 24 hours. And uh, last year was the first time I did it, and I can vouch for the fact that it's it's no joke. You might think, oh, man, we're just walking. It yeah. can't be. How hard can it be? Um, if you do not take proper nutrition, do not keep your electrolytes up, you will bonk just like I did and I I mean about five miles from finishing I got hyponatremic and I wasn't taking salt tablets like I should have and I wasn't you know I just wasn't taking care of myself the way I figured I needed to and uh so that's a huge so that's what the rim to rim to rim is Chris how many times have you done rim to rim to rim five times now five times so this guy does it every year he's done it for five years and do you ever have any plan? Like, do you, you see, foresee a time when you're not going to do it? No, yeah. no. In fact, Dave Martin, who's or I call him, he's kind of the founder of it. Yeah, um, yeah. He's done it like 16 times, and he's wow. the guy that who's kind of the the grandfather of it for us. Uh, we say every year. I mean, it's just it's that it's that milestone every year that you feel yep. like if I I got to do this. You yeah. know, it's like if I if I quit, I'm getting old. Yeah, you know? and, and it's important to have those things. Oh yeah, and it just like, like the benchmark work, those benchmark events that you do every year that just like i'm going to continue to do this because i'm a i'm a firm believer in if you don't use it you lose it right right like uh, if you don't if you don't jump every day just jump up on a box like every week anyway you know pretty soon you're not going to be able to jump yeah if you don't you know if you don't stretch every day pretty soon you're not going to be as, as mobile as you were no doubt. if you do the rim to rim to rim every year it's going to keep mo- keep you motivated to stay spot on with your nutrition with your fitness and it's going to and you're going to continue to do these things really you know barring some injury why would you not be doing it when you're 80 right just keep doing it yeah, yeah there's just keep doing it we every year i see some guy on there that's 65 70 that's doing it and i'm like all right so you know if I, I can still you know if he's doing it i'll do it you that, know that's right because it is there's not a single day even on a dull sheep hunt <clears throat> that was you know brutal tough hunt there there was not one of those days on that hunt where that was tough mentally as the rim drum drum is yeah and that's so, you know let's just jump into that let's, let's hear that i mean that's a great story right there chris the, I mean, the sheep hunt yeah i mean that that sheep hunt that you told me about I mean, floored me. I was like, man, that's yeah. that's a heck of a. And we all know sheep hunting stuff, but this is this is kind of the next step, level. So yeah, this is this is my train to hunt plug. Okay, and, and, there uh, you go. Because it really is the reason I was able to do it. I mean, I five years before that, uh, my wife and I were up in Alaska, and and we did just a little hike in Denali, and I was just, I mean, I was dying. I was. F- 215 pounds at the time wow and just in terrible shape yeah and uh i said okay I, something's got to change and already at that point i already said i had already written off that sheep hunting was ever in my future i'm like there's no way you know yeah yeah and so we made some dietary changes and and you know started you know cut the weed out and you know tried the the gluten-free thing and then moved to paleo and slowly surely a few pounds started coming off but i still was just not strong yeah um and that was about the time train to hunt came around yeah and and which is also i think the first year or the second year that i'd actually done the rim to rim to rim and even doing the rim to rim i'm like i still can't i I can't climb those mountains i don't have the strength right and uh so i started doing the train to hunts and just and then started doing the workouts yeah and i I actually wrote an article once and i never and i can't find it anymore and i printed it (laughs) but the title of it was i needed to get in shape so the first thing i did is drop my gym membership right i did i had to get out of just you know plodding Mm -hmm. to the gym each morning and climbing on elliptical just like you said in our workout this morning you'll always if by yourself you'll just stay in your comfort zone that's right you know you got to do something to get out of your comfort zone yep and getting on the train to hunt workouts um and and logging in and actually saying okay i did do this workout you know it just started that accountability started coming so anyway, so two years ago, um, I I knew because I'm in the super masters class at the time I was 53. Yep. So anybody that doesn't know and train to hunt, there's different age classes. Yep. Uh, but the problem with being in the super masters is every year my competition's getting younger. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm yeah, getting right. a little bit older, and you got some 49 year old <laughs> dude that just turned 50. And yeah. So I, there's I don't have another break coming. So that year I was like, you know. I really would like to win. If nothing else, stand on the podium at nationals. And I said, yeah. if you're going to do it, this year's probably just better than next year. Yep. So I was training hard for training on nationals. I mean, I was, I was pushing it really hard. And, uh, and then about four weeks from nationals, 
uh, Mike Duplan called me and he said, hey, looks like I might be able to put together a, a dull sheep hunt that would be two on one. And, and Steve Johnson with Ultimate Alaska Outfitters, he's like, he really wants to, to film a hunt. He says, we can probably split the cost. I'm like doing the math going, okay, financially, I can probably pull this off and physically, okay, I've been training as hard as I can. I mean, this is yeah. if I'm ever going to be able to do it. And so I literally had four weeks notice. That's you know, but you were training so stinking hard exactly. for the uh, nationals that you were ready. Yeah, my my base fitness level was was you know as good as I thought it need, it could be. Yeah, and uh, you know, four weeks before I was on a plane, which man, I missed nationals that year because I was sheep hunting during which nationals. Which is the point. Right? <laughs> which is exactly why we do it. And uh, you know, day one was uh, was uh, whew, like about five thousand foot climb. And, and then when you you get to the very top, there's a thing they call a head wall. And, yeah. uh, and when you look at it, even when I look at it when we on the TV show, I'm like, I can't believe we climbed up that with 60 pound packs on our backs. I mean, it was just all but vertical, but big boulders. So you're just like scrambling, Jeez. and uh, it was brutal. Right? So hand, like kind of hands and feet. Oh yeah, hands and feet. Pole trekking poles put away. Just just climbing and you know it was probably 200 vertical feet to get you know, and and before that you had this like scree slope that you couldn't even stand up and climb on you had to be on all fours because you just it was literally once two steps forward slide back one and just had i mean just bear crawling up to, to get to the base that we start like hand over and uh, got to the top got over the next side and and we were sitting there making dinner i'm like okay, I could, I could get up and go again right now if we had to, fortunately yeah. we don't have to, but, yeah. but, uh, I could, I could get up and go again Yeah, and made it through that sheep hunt. And I mean, I lost 11 pounds. It was, it was an amazing hunt. I mean, it, we hiked from the time I killed the sheep, it was three days to get back to the road. And then we just put meat. Now you got meat on your, mm, on your yeah. back too. And you know, I got to the highway after three days and Man, we were, you know, it was good to go. Three and, three days of hike out. Yeah, three days. Get up in the morning, make some coffee, eat a couple almonds, start hiking, you know, just Sit have eat. some, you know, dinner at night and, and get up the next morning and do it again. <laughs> Jeez, that's, that's unreal, man. That's... But what an adventure. And, you know, oh, yeah. one of the things that I, I, try, I talk about when it comes to fitness and hunting is that if nothing else, like, even if you're not sure what to do if you're just out there doing it and you're grinding away and you're pushing through some physical limitations in your workouts you're going to have this confidence that you wouldn't enter the mountains or the woods or the you know the field with right and so even if you may not be exactly where you need to be in order to you know maybe you're not exactly where you want to be but like the confidence that you're going to gain through your conditioning like you knew yeah. you know what i'm ready if imagine if you would have got that call and he gave you four weeks notice and you hadn't been training, yeah. you know, and that's yeah. an, another big deal is like train year round. Right. Like I think there's a, something to say about be prepared all the time. So when the call comes, you're ready. Exactly. You don't have to prepare. Like when the call comes, you can go. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the point of, of, you know, our style of training. And I believe that if you're ready for, uh, you know, to be, go out and perform in the field, in the world, in like this, this, these remote places in these rugged countries, I mean, there's going to be very few things that you couldn't do. You're going to be able to do like a Spartan race. You're going to be able to do a train to hunt challenge. If you were ready to go, you know, on a three day backpack, like heavy through the, you know, the Alaska wilderness right. you're ready for a train to hunt challenge oh yeah yeah you know and and vice versa if you're ready for a train to hunt challenge you're probably you're probably pretty close to ready to do just about any, any, no, no any doubt. hunt too so no doubt i mean nationals uh I, you know you watch guys that you know i look at them okay you know this, this guy he, he could get to another fitness level if he keeps training yeah but somehow they grind out at nationals and get it done yeah i mean there's a yeah. mental the mental component of just getting it done I mean, yeah. you learn so much about yourself i mean that and gain mental toughness for sure for sure jesse got a little mentally tougher when he started doing training huh <laughs> yeah <laughs> I Jess, did. jesse's got a good story too yeah man he uh kind of changed your world a little bit too but changed my life man like everything about it now I get to sit here and talk with Chris Denham. <laughs> Rather than sit on the, sit and eat your milkshake. Drink your milkshake. Drink my milkshake, man. 
<laughs> yeah. It's, I miss it's, milkshakes, though. Yeah, they are delicious. <laughs> but there, yeah. there's no, nothing tastes as good as discipline, man. No, I always yeah, say that. There's nothing that tastes or feels better than discipline. Like, if you have the discipline to get up and go work out, like, sleep's not going to feel yeah. better than getting up and being after that workout. You're going to be so glad that you yeah. got out of bed and went and got that workout in. I think the biggest change to me for Train to Hunt has it, it, it has made me self-disciplined in the way in a way that's like i don't make excuses for myself anymore right yeah like excuses are gone and if i find myself starting to make an excuse you know it's like suck it up buttercup <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know and then like that i have that that strong will and then you know and then the next thing i would say you know doing all those personal changes it's absolutely revolutionized my my kids mm-hmm. you know i mean they especially my younger boys man my and when I, when i and they're my they're my accountability now you know i come yeah. home and my youngest son evan is like dad we're gonna work out you wanna work out <laughs> what's the workout today dad can i write it can i write the workout and uh That's i'm like awesome. yeah let's do this man <laughs> and then it's just like son of a gun we're doing 150 burpees <laughs> <laughs> no doubt evan's a little animal man yeah for sure it is cool as a parent to because my kids were in high school junior high age when when i started you know getting into trained to hunt and doing the making this kind of transformation and and my wife and i are like our kids i mean they make because when they're on their own i'm like they're making terrible choices about food and all sure. that they know better and and then all of a sudden you know now looking at them as adults and my my son sends me a picture one night and it's a a, a dish he made with radishes from my garden and cauliflower and broccoli and elk meat and he's sending me a picture he's so proud of this dinner i'm like yeah yeah this is my son <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah. is, this, this is, is what he's sending me these yeah. are the pictures he, you know. yeah that's it, it is it's such a great it's amazing how much influence we have on our kids mm -hmm. you know and just to have them um we'll see us struggle and it's something that a buddy of mine and i were talking about with that when you work out with your kids mm -hmm. they get to see you in a whole never oh, another yeah. another element right because they grow up and you're telling your guy them right you're telling them no and good job and you know don't do that mostly for me it's mostly no <laughs> like, yeah stop yeah. doing that but then you get to, they get to a point and you can train with them and they actually have an opportunity to encourage you right because you're always encouraging them and disciplining mm -hmm. them and guiding them and then you get to a point where you're out there and you're struggling together and they get a chance to go come on dad come yep. on mom you know yeah. let's go and i think that's important oh, yeah. for them to be able to see you in uh, you know struggle and, and get through that and and it builds i think it builds a bond that it's tough to uh, build in any other platform oh yeah so you know get out there and work out with your kids you guys yeah yeah Talk and it's about. usually evan you know encouraging me for about 10 minutes after, after he's done you. with the workout <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know that feeling <laughs> yeah yeah i think we've all been there so I want to get back real quick. I want to get back to hunting because we've talked in the past and it's something that I really am interested in because hunting has changed so much and you've been around the hunting world and, you know, not even, not to industry per se, but just like the, just you've seen gear change so much. You've seen, um, you know, people's attitudes change so much. You've seen all these things, Chris, like. I remember you telling me the story about your first bow and how you taped a matchstick oh, yeah. to the bow. I mean, yeah. that's and how many years ago was that? Like that wasn't oh, that long ago. No, was it, it wasn't. Like, I mean, I was in college. Yeah. You know, so we're talking 82, 83, 84. Yeah. yeah in the eighties. Yeah. I mean, you had, you bought your first compound or. Yeah. I actually got it with, uh, with, uh, uh, I sold seeds. You know, as a kid, they used to have when you guys are not quite old enough yeah. to know this, but like there, uh, the uh, was a Boys Life magazine. It was the Boy Scouts had a magazine oh, in the okay. back. You could, they, you could, if you send it like thirty five dollars or something, you got this big package of seeds because people gardened a lot back then, mm -hmm. more than they do now. Yeah, and I'd go door to door selling seeds and made enough money to buy this it was a browning cobra it was a wood riser bow wood it was a one piece wood riser wood limb bow that no was my way. first compound no way and, and uh yeah i just sold enough seeds to buy it because i like probably 45 pound bow yeah and, wow. you know it didn't even it, did, it didn't even it wasn't even drilled and tapped to put sights on because nobody there was no nobody made sights no back sights. then yeah right huh. and what kind of rest did it have it was just a little flipper thing yeah you know, mm -hmm. just a little plastic flipper that stuck on the side yeah and there was no archery shops so i mean you, do, you had to like really get, take care of your stuff right? yeah because just getting a dozen arrows you know back it was almost all wood arrows back then too yeah and 
So yeah, you you kept you kept close eye on everything. Yeah, yeah no releases. No releases. No sights. All right. Wooden arrows. So if you miss, you broke them. Yep. I mean, and now, I mean, now look at what we got now. The technology. Do you think? Do you? How much of that? How much of the advancement of technology do you? Um, credit because nobody bow hunted back then either right, right? like no. talk about that like i mean i know for for myself and i've only been you know bow hunting and this you know my dad bow hunted so probably like i got about a 30 year perspective and uh and there wasn't hardly anybody bow hunting and if they if they were bow hunting they weren't very successful much of the time no and uh you know talk about that like just your maybe your group of people that you hung out with and hunted with and how much bow hunting you did and when you started like okay i, I really like bow hunting and why? Yeah, well, I mean, bow hunting for me, it's kind of weird. I, it's almost like genetic because I wanted to bow hunt from, the, that was all I ever wanted, the first thing I can remember ever wanting to do. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, so, I mean, I had the little fiberglass bow. In fact, my first oh, yeah. bow, it's, it's a funny story. My first bow, uh, there was a neighbor across the street and he was a bow hunter. Yeah. My family didn't hunt at all. And that's all I want to do. I'm five years old and I want to go hunting. Yeah. And uh, so he told me he was making, building an addition onto his house. And he said, okay, if you come over every day and sweep and pick up nails and sweep, then at the, when we're done, I'll buy you a bow. So when we're, it, it was all summer. So we finished and he got back then when you went to the grocery store, um, you, it would depend on how much groceries you bought. You got S and H green stamps mm. and there was this, you got these stamps and there was a store in the grocery store. So you collected these stamps and you put them in a, licked them and put them in a book. Yeah. When you had a certain number of books, you could buy something in that store with those, with those books. So we got enough S and H green stamps to go get one of those, a Ben Pearson fiberglass, uh, you know, recurve, you yeah, know, like yeah. 15 pounds, you know, something <laughs> yeah, like yeah. that. And that was my, that was my first bow. Wow. My first bow hunt was lizards in the desert, you know, just yeah. sneaking around trying to shoot a lizard with your bow That's and it was wild. sandy. So you, your arrows didn't get busted up. Right. Was, right. Do you so, still have it? No, no, no. I have no idea where that bow went. Yeah. I just, you know, there's certain things you wish you kept. Yep. It. Yep. And uh, I'm not really even a sentimental person when it comes to equipment, but I, I wished I still had that. Yeah, sure. But uh, so then, you know, then that that brownie cobra, and then when I get, got to college, uh, ran into the the one guy at Arizona State University that liked to hunt, and uh, and we just became best friends and just yeah. started. You know, we were we we take we'd go over sneak onto the air, the issues. Uh, uh, archery teams yeah. they had bales and we'd go climb the fence we kept our bows in our dorm rooms and we'd climb over the fence and, and shoot their targets and i can still remember the first time so i was raised in southern arizona yeah and we didn't have any elk in southern arizona and uh, i can still remember the first elk hunt i ever went on uh when i had a tag and this bull this bull comes in and I shoot at him, <laughs> which was done a lot back yeah, then. Oh yeah. And I missed him by, I was probably 10 feet. He was probably 30 yards. We didn't have range finders either. Yeah. So I was probably, he was probably 30 yards. I shot 10 feet over his back and probably 15 feet behind him. Oh my God. I, I missed him by, I, I still to this day, I'm like, how in the world did you, you didn't even have your bow pointed in the right direction? You know? I did that. You were like, oh yeah. I was just looking at that yeah. elk and, you know, he's yeah. screaming and got cows and I'm like, holy crap, this is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it's, uh, that's funny. Learned a lot about adrenaline. Yeah. yeah that's too. wild. So on that note, did you, like when you guys were out there practicing, mm -hmm. did you like, how much was like, how much did you think about like, okay, this is my effective range. And like, I, I know like I, if he's this far or was it just kind of a guess kind of a guessing game it was like, kind of a guessing game yeah you know, like, again you didn't have range finders right you didn't we didn't 3d shooting wasn't even invented yet right know? there was yeah. no life-size targets no. it was just shoot, shooting bales and just and shoot, bullseyes shoot. exactly <laughs> and uh so yeah if, I mean, my effective range was probably 30 yards you know i mean that was probably about it yeah yeah no sights no release no. fingers yep Great. And what kind of broadheads were you shooting back then? Um, wasp. wasp, 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 and sh and satellites. Uh, yeah, yeah. The blades that would break if you, yep. you know, if you looked at them. Wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, did you ever end up killing anything with that bow? No. Never kill no, anything. That's a bit like small games, you know, yeah, small right. rabbits and stuff. Only like dreams, that. man. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So okay, so um, so talk about like there was you and your buddy, basically the only guys you knew that were out there bow hunting, right? Right. 
Uh, did you run into many bow hunters when you were out there hunting elk? Would, yeah, because, you know, back then it was like, hey, you're a hunter, you're a bow hunter, you're out here. So, like, camps, you know, in Arizona is pretty cool because you got you know, dispersed camping and it's relatively easy country. So, you're seeing guys all the time. Yeah. Everybody stopped and talked. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. everybody, you could just go, like, hey, you guys have any luck today? Yeah, I was on a good bull right over here. They, yeah. Everybody was an open book. Yeah. You know, nobody was like, nobody's hiding. You know, no, no, yeah. haven't seen anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when you're talking about everybody, how many people are you talking about? Oh, you know, by the time I really got started, I mean, I can remember as a kid, there'd be leftover archery bull tags in Arizona. I believe it. Wow. Yeah. I believe it. There would be wow. leftover tags for Unit 10. You guys, <laughs> just, let's pause for a second and you guys absorb that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, there's leftover archery bull tags in Arizona. Yeah. Arizona. Arizona. It yeah. was it was crazy. And I still remember uh gosh, the Elmer brothers. Um he actually killed what at the time was the world record it was like three hundred and eighty nine inch bull. Yeah. And it, they put it on the cover of Outdoor Life. Yeah. And everything changed. Yeah. With, the, with that cover story. Really? You wow. just it just Yeah, instantly it. people started, you know, people started picking up bows and, and it was a craze that, you know, happened like in the mid eighties right there where yeah. bow hunting took off pretty pretty intense. Is that when the when the gear started getting better? Is that when like Yeah. Because back then like Hoyt you know, Hoyt and Matthews Bowtech, those guys, they weren't they weren't in the picture. It was like yeah. Pierce and like PSE. PSE. PSE was a big company. Hoyt was there, but they weren't really, they were more into target bows. Yeah, you know, right. Honey bows. I mean, Chuck Adams was shooting them. But, yep. uh, yeah. uh, but the bear. Bear archery. Yeah, bear's yeah. been around forever. Yeah, right. That's what my, that was my first bow. The yeah. little bear recurve. Mine too. Yeah. You know? So uh, how many, how many years do you think uh, you hunted with that bow and then when did you decide, okay, it's time to upgrade or whatever? Well, it's actually when I, uh, after college even, uh, okay. when I went to work and did, at that retail store, it was called Jensen's custom ammo in, in Tucson and we had an archery shop yep. and Jensen's was like the Mecca of hunting in that, in that, that was the store I mean, for all of Southern Arizona. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so I was, I felt so I was, I felt lucky to be yeah. working at Jensen's for $3 and 85 cents an hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was working in the place I went to as a kid and just was in awe, yeah. you know, of the store yeah. and so I got I started working in the archery department I mean and I, I think about it now I mean I knew nothing here I'm in the archery counter giving advice to guys who know just a little less nothing than I know yeah you know? right that's what that's we it. didn't know anything you know tuning bows wasn't even a thing because you had you know steel cables yep so yep. there wasn't anything you do but to put a string on there and move your burger button up and down you it know? was about 20 percent let off or oh, yeah oh yeah 40 well we were about 40 then 40 yeah and, and that's when the overdraw craze kind of hit and speed bows and people started and then 3d shooting started and yep. when 3d started that really really brought a lot of people in the yeah. industry sure because there was guys making I mean that's where Randy Omer you know kind of came into prominence as a shooter yep and there was like big money in 3d shooting back then and it, it, really? espn covered it it was covering huh. 3d shoots and wow it was kind of a it was a pretty cool time but that must have been the, why everybody started making sites and yep. better ways to make releases and better ways to, to you know rest and that must have been like that big deal right yeah if you're men and you start keeping score as soon as you start keeping yeah. keeping score, the technology is going to change fast. Yeah. Right? You can People, figure out how to win. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. If ESPN start covering it, and yeah. you're like, you know what? I think I can do this, and I can do it better than they can. You're right. That's yeah. wild. So, um, what about like? So the number of people increased, obviously, with, uh, and you said basically after that guy killed the world record, and right. the technology kind of came around, and uh, has it been just kind of a slow increase in numbers in bow hunters? in you know in in arizona and now like how how do you see where do you see it going at this point it's it, it's an interesting conversation because if you look like at arizona game of fish how it prints a book every year they've been doing it from, <coughs> since the 60s i think uh i need to go get it again i kind of got out of looking at print stuff but uh um the success rate back in those days was about 20%, you know, in the, in the late eighties okay. uh, for archery bull. Okay. And if you look now, it's only about 30%. It hasn't increased quite as dramatically as most people would think. Yeah. Yeah. And first of all, I, I attribute a lot to back then guys were just a little bit tougher, you know, Oh sure. Like guys, yeah. sure. You, a lot know. more labor workers, a lot more right. physical jobs, a lot more. There was just a lot more guys that were just in their day-to-day -day life just had to be tougher. Yeah. You know? And they, they, there were guys that kind of grew up hunting. And, yeah. you know, and nowadays I think 
guys have just gotten maybe a little bit lazier uh, as a whole, you know. But sure. of course, the, then there's the, the train to hunt crowd, you know, that's it's pushing the envelope, and and so I see it getting a little more, uh, definitely a little more intense. I mean, I, th I think we're seeing it. I mean, we're here at the Western Hunter and Conservation Expo in Salt Lake City right now, yeah. and you look around today now. <sighs> There's a lot of fit dudes in there and, yeah. and women. I mean, there are workout this morning. I mean, yeah. those women were crushing it. Yeah. Well, just to think, think about this. Did you think about the, the Western hunter, what, like say four years ago, five years ago, right. Um, compared to now that we had a workout going, I think, uh, there was like the, the, uh, Cameron Haynes, um, 5k. Right. Um, there was, there was like two or three, uh, there's a hike. There was a couple trail hikes, a couple trail hikes. Yeah. I mean, people are getting up and, and, and they're enjoying Let's mm -hmm. get together and be, get and do some do a workout. Get physical. Yeah, yeah. Let's do a hike. Let's do a run. Let's do a workout. And uh, so the whole idea of fitness being at least a part mm -hmm. of hunting um, is really coming to fruition. Yeah. You know, because because before, well, let's face it. Before you really didn't need to on purpose like go out of your way to train for a, a hunt because most of the time like my, like all the guys i grew up with in north idaho all the guys were they worked in the woods yeah they ran up and down the woods with the saw on their yeah. on their shoulder yeah. or they were hooking logs or they were they were doing something physical so when hunting season came they were basically just enjoying it rather than hu hunting in it yeah. now and so with technology the advancement of just overall technology and um we sit way more we i mean i would dare how about this here's something just a side note one of the workouts that I would, I would um, encourage anybody to do out there, I would encourage anybody to try to, from the time you get out of bed and stand up, try not to sit for more than one hour until you lay down at night. Okay. Like stand and stand and, and work, stand and eat, stand and watch your TV, stand do whatever you're doing, stand and don't sit down. Only you get one hour of sit down time for the whole time you're awake. Just that alone is something that people used to do all the time. Yeah. They, they're on their feet, they're working, yeah. they're moving back and forth, they're walking back and forth. Um, and now we just do a ton of sitting. I mean, sitting's what the new smoking, right? right. That's what they say now. Smoking, yeah. So um, I didn't really think I, I put a st I have a stand up desk now that I work at. Good. And uh, and I don't really sit down. The only time I actually sit down is if I have to write an article. I, yeah. I still can't do that while I'm standing up. Yeah, I got to yeah, sit yeah. down and focus. Yeah. But, uh, and I, you know, last year doing the rim, during the rim, I was coming out the South Rim and I felt good. Yeah. And I was feeling, and, but in my fitness level from last year to the year prior, I didn't think it was any, really any better. I was kind of just as good as I was probably going to be able to get, but I felt really good coming out. And I attribute a lot of it to just time on my feet. Sure. You know, just used to being doing. on my feet all day. And so being on your feet for 20 hours and walking just wasn't as big a deal as it was two years earlier. Yeah. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Yeah, stand up desk and like I said, just keep standing. Yep. It's a big deal. So with today's, I mean, the people are getting it and they're out there training. I mean, um, there's you're you're seeing that the, the there's just the thing, the times are changing there's a little bit more intense there's a little bit there's quite a few more hunters out there mm -hmm. and uh and so uh, like what are your overall thoughts about hunting now and where do you th where do you see hunting say in 10 years that is really it, it it's a tough call because there's so many there's so many more factors involved in why people want to hunt these days yeah you know through social media and everything i think there's a lot there's there's a little too much emphasis on on trophy hunting you yeah. know, per se because yeah. we everybody wants to post a picture of a big buck yeah no uh, i think it brings out a lot of bad things in people sure um, and uh but people getting people back to where they understand why they hunt i think is just yeah. one of those things that's critical and because it's in the anti-hunting world and there's just there's just, there's more hunters out there than there are anti hunters. Yeah. But still, 80 percent of our population, 90 percent of our population is there's just non hunters. That's just, all they are. They're just ambivalent to it for the right, most part. Right. And uh, and I really do think that we just started a new uh, page in the in the magazine, Western Hunter Magazine. It's basically why why we hunt. Yeah. And because it occurred to me is like I hear so many guys, somebody will ask them why you hunt, and they don't they don't have an intelligent answer for that because they haven't really thought, it thought through. about it, you know, and the first thing I would say, they hunt for the meat. Yeah. Well, no, we don't, you know, that's right. I mean, I love it, but if that was all I, the reason I hunted, I'd just shoot the first thing I ever saw. And, yeah. And if there was no enjoyment in the journey, if there was just like, man, I'm out there doing one thing and that's right. meat gathering only, we wouldn't bow hunt. Right. Oh yeah. We'd just, yeah, we wouldn't be bow hunting at all. If you're, if you're starving to death and someone says, okay, 
the only food that you get is you got to go kill your own meat. Right. And someone had a bow in one hand and a rifle in the other. There's no way you're reaching for the bow. Right. Right. So we it we really enjoy the meat, but you know, like exactly. you said. Like you said. And is it just about the trophy? No, it's not just about the trophy. And the one that gets me the most is is people will say, well, hunting is conservation. Uh, you're right. That's a good. That's a good speech to tell another hunter. But that's where our dollars go. But yeah, that's where our dollars go, and it's a great story to keep telling it. But it's not why you hunt. Right. I mean, I, if 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 there was no tags and no, con- I'd still hunt. If there was, you know, there was no conservation organizations, I'd still be a hunter. Right. Know? Yeah. So that's not why I hunt, obviously, either. I mean, right. It's a it's a good story to be told. But mm-hmm. uh, so we started this our, this section, and we're just having different people write. Like Ryan Lampers just wrote one for me, yep. uh, and. Uh, and I, my my vision is is that people read enough of stories of of guys who have really thought about it. If they read enough times, they'll formulate their own. Sure. You know, they say, yeah. you know what? You know, I never actually thought about it, but that guy's got a point. That's that's certainly a reason why I hunt. Yeah. I mean, you have to have your own testimony. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm-hmm. And nobody can argue with your own testimony either. You know, if you say yeah. this is why I hunt, they can't say no. That's not why you hunt. I'm yeah. Like, <laughs> I just told you that's why. I, exactly. I exactly. You, just, exactly. you can't why argue hunt? this point. You know? <laughs> exactly. You can say, so. man, maybe you shouldn't tell anybody that. <laughs> you know, you can't argue with it. Yeah. It's an interesting point because it is something that is very personal. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a few things that I believe to be. Uh, I, I can't say it's, it's it's for everybody, but all the, certainly all the guys that I hunt with and all the guys that I know who are hunters. I mean, it's really. Um, I heard the I heard the statement yesterday. It's not the size of the trophy; it's the size of the hunt. Right. And so it's the journey, right? right. Like it's how big was this hunt? Like right. It's whether it be, I mean, how much effort did you have put into it? How much preparation was there? How much uh, adversity was there? How many laughs did you have? Who right. were you with? It's the size of the hunt, right? right? It's not the size of the trophy, because yep. really, I mean trophies eventually they all they all end up they're, they're they end up somewhere i mean the, everybody who has mounts skull mounts pretty soon they're gonna they're just not gonna be around anymore yeah. but those memories are always gonna be there yeah. and uh, i heard steve Ranella say it uh, really well one time about how uh, it, how trophy hunting shouldn't be a dirty word because the trophy that we're we're actually displaying is no it's kind of like a medal like for somebody who earned a medal in any kind of other sports endeavor right? right and that we can look at that buck or that whatever that that is on the wall or that you're picking up out of your garage and say hey look at this buck and they, and people don't like just say look at this buck and end a story right it's this it's all it's the journey that led to the buck right. that people want to hear right like if i go if so that's like that's the trophy there's no reason there's there's no there's no shame in having a trophy or a medal i mean call it something else but right. it's basically just a symbol of how big the hunt was right, right? so it's mm-hmm. it's it's just a misconception i think that we as hunters need to really take some time to think about so that we have an ele- at least an elevator pitch when someone says man you hunt like why would you do that you can actually say this is why this is why i hunt and yeah. it can be like oh okay that makes sense mm-hmm. or I, I think once you kind of understand that you start to uh, embody that for lack of a better term the now all of a sudden conservation makes more sense now i mean you're looking at at some conservation organization you want to go work on a project you want to get your kids involved it's like right. you realize that it is more than just you know killing something i mean yeah. there's it's it means more to you than just that so you you start you know you get involved in conservation you get involved in educating you know bringing a new a new hunter in yeah and all of a sudden i'm at the archery shop and i see somebody struggling or i'm at the range and i see somebody struggling and i'm inclined to go over and say hey maybe i can help you out you know with this you know, right or, right uh, you're just i and i'm kind of an open book when people say well how, how do you you know how do you do something i, I want to help other people get better not just to get better to go kill something so that but so they enjoy the experience, experience more, more. Mm-hmm. yeah absolutely i think yeah. it's a, it's it's a great point yeah, yeah, and I, think I think that's the the thing that bugs me about social media is it's like social media has, has almost turned hunting into a competition i know, you know where it's now, i know we got to show off you know yeah because yeah. yeah. how many people are posting a picture of the two point you know right it's right it, a few but not yeah. many yeah exactly not many and there, and you can only get so much in a in a media post right you know, you can get a picture and you can get maybe a, a short, like, little blurb about, you know, how thankful you are or whatever. But it, until, you know, and you might look at a picture and a little blurb and go, ah, I'm next. But then you run into them and they tell you the whole story and you're just like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and, and to your point with, with like, hunters saying, well, hunters are conservationists. It's like, 
you know, truly, uh, you know, in my, like I said, the guys I, I, I hunt with and run with understand that in order to dance, you need a partner. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so as, as people who take, um, you know, just love and have a passion for, for the experience of the hunt, we understand that if our query goes away, then we don't get to do what we love to do. Right. And so it it was a, it's a good question to ask, um, about like, if, if someone said, if someone told me, look, you can't, you can't hunt anymore the rest of your life. You can't hunt you can't hunt elk or deer the rest of your life because, but your that'll, but your sons will like your sons will be able to, but for the next, you know, 40 years, we're going to shut her down, but you're, there's going to be opportunity for your kids. And that's the only way we foresee being able to, you know, conserve these animals and be able to bring them back up to where they need to be, man. Fine. Be I, give it I, up. Oh, for sure. I would, I just I'd have no problem with that. I mean, it wouldn't even be a question. I mean, I just do more camping and more glassing and more pictures and more of these kind of things. Um, but it's important to me that my sons get the experience right. that I've had for the last 30 years mm-hmm. and the next generation gets it. And I'd be willing to give it up in order to do that. Right. You know, and I think that most of the guys that I run with would be, would say, yeah, if it means preserving the the species so that yeah. further people can enjoy it heck i'd hang them up and i'd hang them up and i'd start like i'd i'd start raising beef and grass fed them <laughs> feed them yeah. you know like i'd do something yeah. that, that, that would make sense All i wouldn't right. it's not like i could stop eating meat but i would find a, a good source good of protein source. and i would like dive into that All i'd right. you know, start raising cows right exactly. so it's a uh, it's it's it, it, and i think that's in 10 years i think um hunting can be better absolutely you know I, I think that it can be better i think it's better now than it was 20 years ago yeah absolutely as far as animal numbers yep it's when you look at, at animal numbers and just hunter's mentality i mean 20 years ago you know the idea of party hunting you know going out and shooting deer mm-hmm. for your wife was you know on your wife's tag that was like totally acceptable for you sure know? and nowadays you know, that's just absolutely unacceptable you know yeah. from the masses anyways yeah absolutely yeah. but and, the other thing to your point i think that maybe 20 25 or 30 years ago i know that i grew up in a household where it was meat gathering right my dad went my dad went out and he and he shot deer mm-hmm. and he shot one for you know my sister right because and it was literally the first deer that stood still got a bullet right. and we he, he, my, I remember my many nights my dad cutting deer up on our kitchen table right. and wrapping it up because it, it was meat it was pure meat gathering right. not to say he didn't enjoy it but I, I guarantee it wasn't like he wasn't going out and camping and like getting with, together with his yeah. buddies he was right. I'll be right back right. Yeah. and he'd walk out the back 40 and be dragging <laughs> a deer come back about a half hour later and, and, some, and, the, and the big one was, wasn't the, the size of the rack it was the size of the body <laughs> that's right. the other thing chris have, yeah. you, have you noticed that probably i mean yeah, there's probably a time that you can remember when guys say well how big was it and they yeah. wouldn't say the score of the horns they would say the size of the oh, body yeah, yeah. Hey, man that thing was it was 200 pounds right. and you're like wow that's a big deer yeah yeah Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, Ryan Hatfield is the editor of, of Western Hunter Magazine. He just finished a new book, um, his Idaho's Greatest Bucks. And we were looking through some of the old pictures and, and hearing some of the old stories, Some of because a lot of the old timers are coming to the booth to buy the book. And they talk about how, yeah, this buddy shot this buck in, in this picture. And they're like, where is that thing? I don't know. We just threw it out in the just threw it out in the dump yeah, you know yeah. we, didn't keep, we didn't keep those horns it was 230 inch non typical <laughs> right right they literally were like you can't eat the horns right. so i'm not gonna yeah. pack this thing out yeah. like what well, i'm just gonna like, i got i don't throw them to out pile. behind the barn i'm there. not gonna pile them up exactly. give them to the dog and let the dog run around with them or something yeah yeah it's a different time and it's it speaks loud to yeah. why we hunt. And I think that's an important article. I think that's an important section of that magazine. Yeah. That, that's a really important part. I'm, I'm excited about it, where it can, where it can go. Um, and I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but it just, you, when you, were, you just said about your dad cutting up meat on the uh, table, I listened to a meat eater podcast with Steve Vanella once. Yeah. And it was a guy, he, he did a PhD, his, his uh, doctoral thesis. That's not a thesis. What's a PhD get? Doctor, uh, doctor, uh, whatever, whatever it is that they have to do to yeah, get, yeah. be called, be called yeah. a PhD. Uh, through the, uh, he looked at hunting through the eyes of uh, Outdoor Life magazine because they were a hundred years old at the time. Oh, and, okay. And he's what he pointed out was that you know prior in the 30s and 40s, if you when you went hunting, you came back, you didn't have a freezer. 
People didn't have freezers. They barely, oh, they were right. hardly even refrigerators then. Huh. So when you got back, you know, you're cutting up meat and you were giving it to your neighbors. You're doing everything because you got about a week, you know, unless you're making yeah. jerky. You yeah. got about a week, you know, yeah. especially in southern, you know, in Arizona. Yeah. Your country could hang a little, have a little bit, longer. bit longer. Yeah. But uh, then they invented the freezer. And now all of a sudden hunters would go kill something and put it in the freezer. And they keep it to themselves, yeah. you know, they give it to their neighbors, you huh. know, and, and he talked about that, that transition of, of, uh, the recognizing hunters with a little, we, we lost a little respect when that, when that we started losing respect when that happened with because, the freezer. Yeah. Because of the freezer, hmm. you know, because we weren't sharing with everybody. Right. So yeah. that's something I'm like, personally, one yeah, of my goals good. is to share as much meat as i can yeah now, my freezer's still gonna have some in the bottom of it i'm like that i'm gonna be a little yeah, selfish but, yeah but you know giving is you know sharing meat with with non-hunters well, how important that is to to kind of show one of the reasons why we hunt or the benefit of why we hunt absolutely i think that's a, a very important part because like i uh i'd say probably 10 years ago nine years ago i had a couple neighbors um that you know, knew I hunted. They didn't hunt. They were kind of a couple older couples, and uh, I offered them some some elk burger, yeah. and they were just like, "Oh, absolutely, I'd take some elk burger." And they'd come back, and, "Man, that was delicious," and I'd give them some more. Yeah. And then uh, the next season, uh, we were out. I was out mowing the lawn, and my neighbor comes up and says. Hey, what do you got going? And I was like, Oh, I'm going hunting next week. And he's like, Oh man, that's awesome. Like, boy, I sure like that meat. But I, like I could tell they were excited about the fact that I was going hunting right. too, because yeah. they knew they stood to benefit from right. that. And I was so happy to do it. Then it's a, it's a great point that if we, you know, we, you know, share it, yeah. share it, let people taste yeah. it, see, see what it is. Yep. And, uh, if not, even if they don't become hunters, I mean, th at least they're going to understand you and understand the benefits of it. Right. And that's, yeah. that's important. That's yeah. awesome. Chris. That's, yeah. that's a really, cool, really man. good point. We lost respect with the f inventor of the freezer. Yeah. Thanks freezers. Yeah. Thanks. Dude. Jeez. <laughs> free on, really. free on, kill. Free on, there's, there's the article right there. Free on, killed the hunter. <laughs> the public. Yeah. yeah. That's un incredible. Sure of the hunter so um so chris you uh what uh what do you got lined up for this year like as far as hunting goes well it's uh it's funny you ask like nate's here with me and we'll probably at some point here spend another hour talking about the draws this year yeah because just like everybody else we live eat and breathe by the draw and right we're, we're putting it in multiple states we're looking at all our points for trying to figure out okay if i got enough points to draw here but that hunt might fall over top of something else yeah. so just like everybody else i don't really know <laughs> i don't yeah. know what i'm going to do in this year for sure till the draws come out till the draws come out yeah. i mean i'm going to go back to new mexico for sure because I, I know where i can get a landowner tag so worst case scenario i'll, I'll be able to revert back to that yeah. uh, but that's the only thing i know and coos deer in yeah. arizona because all we have leftover tags worst case scenario we got leftover tags and i'll yeah. i'll I don't care if it's the worst unit in the state, you know, which I don't think they're all good, but coos deers, you're like, that's your, that's your, that's your jam, right? Like yeah, it you is. love it coos is. deer hunting. So if you had one, I just had a quick question. If you had one, one hunt that you could do for the rest of your life and you couldn't do any other hunts, what would it be? It'd be hunting coos deer. Coos deer? Bow or rifle. I don't care. Actually, yeah. coos deer are so hard for the bow. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Me, I just want the thunder stick. <laughs> I heard, yeah. I heard they're just like, is, they're, as, they're as skittish as, you know, as any any other animal on the planet you're ever going to hunt. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, if it's coos deer country, it's mountain lion country, too. I mean, oh, that's right. just, just, they're just symbiotic, those two. Yeah. And, I mean, you're up against the ultimate predator when you're when you're competing with a with a cat Cougar, yeah, yeah. you, yeah. you got to be in the same striking distance he's got to be in yeah. in order to treat him, think you're gonna have a chance to kill him yeah you know, so getting inside and you got a small target so you know you're not shooting coos deer at 60 and 70 yards i mean it, guys are really good get you know and a little bit lucky but uh you know to really get it done you're gonna probably end up inside 50 yards so you're you're inside the striking distance of mountain lion so you got to be as good as a mountain lion <laughs> you know that's that's yeah. incredible so so what's awesome. the draw because I know, uh, so here's what I know about coos deer hunting. You spend a lot of time in the glass, mm -hmm. and f it, for me, it would be a lot of time in the glass seeing nothing. And that it takes a lot. If you think you're a good somebody who's good in the glass, go do some coos deer hunting. From what I understand, and you'll you'll get an education. 
because that's it's what it true, is. Because you could sit there in glass, you could sit in one spot, and obviously I haven't seen a coos deer. Yeah. Now, if you're in elk country and you sit in that one spot, you don't see an elk. You know, there's no elk here. That's you know? right. They're just they're not here. They, right. You can just get up and move. Well, in coos deer country, you never know. In fact, I always know there's a deer. I just haven't seen it yet. Yeah. And there yeah. is. If you're in good coos deer country, there is a coos deer within five or six hundred yards of you, and you know, and sometimes you're glassing a mile or two. There's there's probably thirty deer. And you're, you're sitting there and you haven't seen one yet. And That's so incredible. It's, it's almost like, it's like the, the thrill of the hunt. It's like, like, where's Waldo? You know, yeah, it's like yeah. those kind of yeah. games that you get obsessed with. That's how coozer hunting is. You just get obsessed with the fact that I know there's a freaking I know deer right here. We're so going to, we're going to have to do that. Yeah, for sure. So, so what's the, what's the secret? Let's, if you've been doing this, your basically your whole life, right? What's the glassing secret to coos deer hunting? Well, the tripod. I mean, okay. glassing from a tripod is, I mean, and that's not that big a secret anymore, but a lot of guys still don't, aren't buying that. Yeah. But if you're not glassing on a tripod for coos deer, you're just depending on luck. It's like going out and bass fishing without a fish finder. You're just throwing your line out. Maybe there's something there. Hoping. Maybe, you know, you'll, uh, but uh, with a tripod, everything, everything stops. The world just stops and you just relax. Your eyes relax, your brain relaxes. And if there's even a little bit of movement, you'll pick it up. Yeah. Cause it's, it's kind of crazy, but only 1% of your vision is actually what they call you know, your acute vision. It's actually in focus. Huh. You know, like I can't look at you, you're out of focus. You yeah. Right. Right. If yeah. you read a book, I mean, you look at one letter, you can't, you, if you stare at that one word, you can't read the word that's two words to the left or two words to the right. I mean, it's, you've got a very narrow range, but the rest of your eyes in, in your vision is if it fades to black and white, that 1% is the only part that's actually in true color. Right. So it fades to black and white and it, the rest of your eyes are designed to pick up movement. Yeah. Well, you can't pick up movement if you're bobbling, your head's moving around all the time too. You know, yeah. you gotta, you gotta be, everything's gotta be still. Yep. So when you're sitting there on a tripod and you're focusing and you, you know, and I'm looking for a deer with that 1%. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you can the other 99% will pick up a little bit of movement and then you look up with, you just in, impulsively your eye goes to that movement. Yep. Okay. Maybe it's a bird. Maybe it's a rabbit. Maybe it's just grass moving, you know, and, yeah. then, and then all of a sudden you look and you go, that's an ear. And I just saw an ear flick, you know, huh. and then boom, it's a deer. That's unreal. And it is practice. It's like when you learn to read as a kid, you know, you put your finger on the word and you sound out every letter and, you know, yeah, C, yeah. Jane, run, you know, yeah. you're just in. And eventually you just look at it and you go, C, Jane, run. Right. And then, and then as you're, you know, as you become a proficient reader, uh, the studies are, I think your brain only looks at about 8% of the letters and your brain fills in the gaps. Yeah. yeah. So you're not reading words anymore. You right. just see them. They just, you just know that's what that word is. And you just, boom, you can scan it. You just yeah. crush a page. Well, good looking glassing in general, and coos deer specifically is the same, just like learning to read. Eventually you all of a sudden you see that white, th this white that stands out a little bit, or just this, this one horizontal or this one vertical stripe. And you realize that's a deer's back or that's the inside of a back leg. You yeah. just, that, that white color, you see it. Gosh. Um, so it's just, it's learning to read. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. Try it behind it. And, and the way I, I like my son, Mark is an awesome glasser. And the way I, I kind of taught him and I didn't even know at the time how effective it was. The way I taught him was I, I'd find a deer or, you know, a couple of deer and I'd say, okay, I think Mark, there's going to be a big buck with those does. Okay. So I need, I'm going to look at other places, but I need you to stay on these deer and tell me if he's, you know, I want you to be able to tell me where those deer are at all times. Yeah. So he'd sit there and just stare at those deer and, and, you know, all of a sudden a deer would walk into a bush but he could still see the back leg. Oh, so he was yeah. just, you know, it was just mentally teaching him to, to recognize that yeah. back leg that the deer's still there. It's just a back leg. And eventually, and he starts glassing somewhere else and he sees a back leg. He recognizes it it's a deer. Yeah, yeah. That's, exactly. That's, that's smart. That's cool. a, That's good. That's you got to get your kids on deer right. and just watch them and stand behind stuff. And you can still, pick yeah. them. that's really, really fascinating. That's yeah. awesome. Gosh, I know we're rubbing up against the time. I know we got we got about thirty minutes till the show starts, and you got to be there because people are going to want to shake your hand. Somebody's yeah, somebody's got to be there. Exactly. So <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. And uh, you got any final thought, thoughts, my buddy? Man, I I just really like the um, the thought about um, just that sharing and uh, and how we need to get back to that. And you know, I mean, I've got five kids. You know. And, growing up and they eat it done so but still you know it's just like that that um open handed 
you know, living. Um, I really, I really like that. And I'm, I want to implement that more and, and just share with those around me that, that need it one. And, and that, I mean, we need to do it, you know, it's, it's a really good PR, I think. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So Chris, any final thoughts, my man? Yeah, a little bit the same that, you know, as, as hunters, I just encourage you to, to spread the word, but spread it intelligently, you know, listen more than, you know, listen more than you talk, ask, ask people questions. Uh, and when you have the opportunity to, to, in in be an ambassador for, for our, I don't want to call it a sport. It's our, our lifestyle. Yeah. Be a smart ambassador. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm out. That's it. Cool. I think these guys said it all. Chris, thank you so much. You thank guys you again, guys. Wilderness it. Athlete, Western Hunter, the mo- the magazine, Western Hunter, the movie, and the magazine is Show. is easy to subscribe. And it's yeah. 12 issues a year. There's six issues a year. Six issues a yeah. year. And you guys, honestly, it's worth every single penny, especially if you're trying to get some education. This isn't yeah. just a bunch of trophy pictures with guys. This is education on how to hunt in the West. So yeah. subscribe to Western Hunter, the magazine, watch Western Hunter, the show, and you guys check out the line at uh, Western, uh, at the uh, Wilderness Athlete. They got a great line. I use it um, and I recommend it to everybody. So with that, You guys, thanks for joining us, and have a healthy week.